Is anybody brain full already? <laughs> so during um, lunch, we have a keynote luncheon that's all about access to capital, uh, from micro loans to billions of dollars. And we have industry experts that are going to give you a wealth of information. First up, uh, Terry Billups, Assistant Director, District Director of Economic Development. She was up earlier today. She's going to give you a wealth of information. Uh, Director of Economic Development at Los Angeles District Office of the SBA. As part of her SBA career, she was the Deputy District Director for the SBA in Michigan District Office, covering the entire state of Michigan, and the Deputy District Director for the Pittsburgh District Office in Pennsylvania. Uh, Desiree Patno speaks for herself. <laughs> and Vanessa Nicole Dawson, founder of the Veneta Project and contributor to Forbes. Vanessa is a serial entrepreneur, an active angel investor, and a background with a background in digital development and retail finance. She began her career in retail finance and private equity in Vancouver and New York. Welcome, ladies. That's right, you haven't been here long enough to know that nothing is ever fully planned, so we are a very organic organization. <laughs> so this is truly a very different access to capital kind of panel um, that we put together. Um, various different changes as uh, several had uh, said they would be here, and obviously life happens. So I wanted to make sure that um, we addressed that family first, and we had a fair amount of speakers that had to change out the last minute. So thank you all again, all for being here. Um, so, Sean, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick, because we didn't get to introduce who you are. Uh, Sean Lavager, uh, focus on private equity, special situation private equity, um, for focus area of intellectual property licensing acquisition to build and restructure companies, corporate carve out, roll up strategy, cash generating asset. Sector agnostic, industry agnostic, stage agnostic, geographic agnostic. Uh, basically the thesis to uh, the portfolio is how do we take a couple pennies and make a couple more pennies. Right? How many of you understood what he said? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Love it, right? So the idea is, is that what I mean, if you look at the title, micro to billions. Next to me, obviously, we heard Terry talk earlier from the SBA. They started to close $5,000 loans. So obviously, that's into the micro loans up to $50,000, $150,000. And then we're going to go into Vanessa and talk about startup companies and how she's raised $200 million. And then going down to Sean and, and different things. And then I spoke earlier yesterday uh, regarding having access to $1.5 billion. So the idea is, is that there's a, just a wealth of, and we had the GSEs on board. We had Chris to talk about you know access to capital through the sense that we're going to Freddie Mac for the multifamilies that I want to bring out there. Um, and the idea is, is that there's so many different lanes right now. And the more we can talk about the gender perspective of it, also, we can talk about the avenues that we can get more information and more opportunities into your hands, whether you own your own business or you work for someone who owns their own business, or more importantly, you think about starting your own business. So those are all the things that we want to address right now. Um, so that being said, Terry, let's, let's start from the smaller level. If you were, if you can imagine starting a company, and, and you know, we heard from you know, Chitra being the top of her game, being the you know chief technology officer of, of all of IBM, and now she's you know on her own starting a startup company. And what does that take to scale to go and go through it? Do you raise funds? Do you get money from the SBA? Do you do you hire? You can take it to the opposite end. Um, if you own your own business and you're a real estate agent, let's say, and you start your own brokerage and you had one, um, you, know, you start on your own, how do I hire that system? So the micro end of that, I'd like you to address that. So what we find at SBA is typically small businesses start by bootstrapping, which means you either work from your own savings, you borrow from family, you borrow from friends, um, you get a commercial loan if you qualify. That's usually where most businesses start, sometimes it's you know taking a line against your credit card. That can get you into trouble, but um, realistically speaking, that's really where most businesses start. 
It's only once you get beyond that and you grow a little bit and you start to understand that, okay, I can't continue like this. Like, I need to do something differently. So the first thing you should do is reach out to your lender. And I know we had um, a bank in the audience this morning, and I don't know if they'll agree with me or not, but what I usually say to folks when I speak to them is, how many of you have a relationship with your banker like you do your doctor? And people look at me like, okay, what do you mean? And I always say, well, you go to a doctor, and you probably wouldn't go to that doctor if it was someone who didn't know who you were or didn't understand your medical history. Agree? Yes? Okay. But many of us go to a banker, yet that banker doesn't know who we are. We're sort of faceless. We do our transactions either online or at an ATM. But yet that's the person who is in charge of your financial health. Just like your doctor takes care of your physical and mental health, your banker is your financial health, but most of us ignore it. True? Yes? So I always encourage people to get to know your bank. And it could be that you're very happy with your bank. However, whenever you go to get that small business loan, they don't know who you are. That's a problem. And people say, well, how am I supposed to get to know my bank? Well, number one, you should be going into the bank occasionally and making yourself known to say, hey, I'm one of your small business clients. You know, I'd really like to, to get to know your relationship manager because when I need a loan, I'm coming back. At least that way, from the character perspective, you're not an unknown entity. There's a lot to be said for that. If you do that with your bank and they don't want to talk to you, find a different bank. And many people have a couple different banks. They'll have a small community bank they deal with, they have a big national bank they deal with, that's okay too. But you need to find what fits and work with that. So I say that only to say, whenever you go after that first loan, if you don't qualify commercially, that's where SBA comes in. Most folks don't know that in order to get an SBA loan, you have to be turned down by a commercial lender. So SBA in its infancy was known as the lender of last resort. Uh, it sounds so negative, but the reality is SBA doesn't even make direct loans outside of our disaster loan program. We mitigate the risk to lenders by guaranteeing the loan. So you still work with a bank, you don't work with SBA directly. So you go to your lender, if they say no, you don't qualify commercially, there's a problem, then that's where SBA comes in. And that's why I always say the first thing you should do is understand what SBA does. So we talked about the contracting this morning. We, now we're gonna talk about capital, but there's a counseling piece that we do as well. The beauty of the counseling piece, besides the fact that everything is free, is the fact that you can go and talk to one of our women's business centers who also service men, but they're tailored to women, or one of our small business development centers. You take your business plan in. If you don't have one, we can help with that. Take your business plan in, because most people already have it if you're a business, and let them go through that with you. And one of two things is going to happen. One could be, they say, this is a great business plan, you're ready to go out and seek capital. Okay, great. That's what you do next if you need money. But if the answer is, oh, this needs some work, so let's work on your projections. How much money do you think you need? Most people either think they need too much or don't think they need enough. This is something we do free of charge to you. So the counselor will look at it, run through your financials with you. They'll help you put together projections if you don't have them. They'll look at the capacity you have and say, okay, you know, what do you think you need? If, for example, if you know there's a big contract you want to bid on. They can help you go through that and understand from a startup perspective, what do you qualify for today? Because what you think you qualify for could be dramatically different from what you really qualify from, for. So that should be the building block. See where you are today once you get beyond the bootstrapping period and then scale toward wherever you want to be, which might be that billion dollar mark. So as we go through what SBA can do for you, we go up to five million. Most people would say like, oh wow, that's a big loan. But Desiree mentioned we do 5,000. The reality is we, through our micro loan program, do $500 loans. So like if you're a truly startup, you have no collateral, you don't know where to begin, and you know, maybe you're a home-based business and you just need to buy a sewing machine, well 500 bucks would probably do but that gets you started. So that's, SBA is here to walk the walk from day one all the way through as you scale. Once you get beyond that five million, and we hope you all get there, um, maybe you're gonna buy a building, we have a loan program for that. Um, maybe you're gonna buy a piece of capital equipment, we have a program for that. I mentioned international trade earlier, we have programs for that. 
So it's just really getting to know where you're going and, walk, and let us walk the walk with you because we can really scale with you and most people don't understand that. Excellent, thank you. So we're gonna move all over to Vanessa because we can touch the SCTR and SBR and we'll talk that when we get to the higher scale. So Vanessa, talk to you a little about your background and I'd like to talk about the alternative way, what you're doing, which is so phenomenal and how you've raised your $200 million over the uh, past few years. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so the difference between the SDA and what I do is, is the basics of it is debt and equity. And I think that a lot of the entrepreneurial opportunity out there right now is in this venture capital world and in this equity um, early stage access to capital. And I think that women are very, or not, I think that uh, women are highly, highly underfunded in equity, um, in the world of equity and early stage investing. So I started my career actually in private equity for a shop in New York. Um, we had 16 billion in assets under management doing all of those fancy things that <laughs> he just talked about, later stage stuff though. Um, through that, it was really interesting to see the, what some of the side deals a lot of the guys were working on that were just with their friends or family or networks that were really close to them. So I think that as you look to go for capital, the debt, going after a debt kind of or a loan might be a traditional way to access capital, but a lot of the guys that I was working with, you, you go to your friends, you go to the, the people that have some money and might trust you or might take a bet on you. And so that is kind of the early stage capital that I got really interested in. How can I get a friend to take a bet on me? And why are so many women not funded in that way? So I, I built my first two technology companies in New York and was raising venture capital for those companies. And it's really a difficult route to go in raising, in raising capital, but it's also really difficult when you don't have those natural networks ingrained. So a lot of, like 99%, I think, of capital is controlled by men, and especially later stage capital and a lot of the equity capital. And when you're investing in early stage companies, you don't really have the financials to run off of. So what a commercial bank or a debt lender is going to need from you is all the numbers. They're gonna be, they, they wanna crunch all the data and make this as risk free as possible. So if you don't have that, then you're going to be going after this equity capital where it's really just about the relationship that you have with the, with the lender or the person that's giving you that money. So I got really obsessed with how can women build uh, those networks for access to capital and access to um, equity in, partic in particular. Um, so five years ago, I launched an organization called the Panetta Project, which is a deal flow pipeline and um, capital platform that allows, uh, that sources female-led technology companies specifically. So we don't really work with service companies as of yet, like real estate companies or we really look for big multi-billion dollar market opportunities um, with women that are building tech as their competitive advantage or IP. And we help them access the equity capital that they need to succeed. So we partner with um, venture firms, family offices, high net worth individuals, private equity firms, and we do a lot of the deal sourcing and diligence on early stage companies, and then we funnel them into particular funds via sector specifics or geographic specifics or whatever these uh, investors are looking for, and hopefully help to de-risk their investment potential and to vet deals for these investors. So over the past four or five years, we sourced, we, we usually source around 1,500 female-founded technology companies a year. We help them with uh, getting their pitch together, getting their financials together, whatever they need to get done, and then uh, send them to various different uh, investors, equity investors. And so we, we've helped women raise about 225 million in, in seed stage funding. So these are usually checks anywhere from, I mean, I write checks anywhere from 50 to 250,000 per investment, usually in the earlier stages of growth. And then some of our seed to series A rounds will be if you're raising 5 million, usually a five or $10 million series A. So we're helping these women access this great um, funding resource that is uh, it's, it's dilutive on your business, so you are giving away equity in your company, but uh, you're, you're not 
you, there's the requirements on it aren't uh, necessarily as stringent as some of the debt opportunities that you would have. So yeah, that's kind of in summary what we do. <laughs> Isn't that great? Completely different. So lots of startups out there, um, lots of ways of getting access to money, but here we are, same thing, same place of dealing with getting money 5% less than that for venture capital for women. Um, and we just don't know about it. I mean, where's the platform to go find? Where's the website that directs it? So we're back to the narrative. Who do we know? How do we get the information out? Back to this report. Um, and to making sure that information. So since you two know of, you don't know each other, correct? No. no. Okay. And that, we do work with the SBA though, yeah. We, we definitely have programs where we kind of get founders ready for your funding or in later stages. So yeah, it's definitely synergistically, I think there's a time in your business where you want to be looking for different types of funding. You're going to go through an equity round, you're going to go through a debt round, you're going to maybe get acquired by his shop one day. So you kind of need to, you know, um, yeah, have, have knowledge of all of the different platforms. Yeah. And then I mentioned <laughs> that we're with you from sort of, I'll call it cradle to grave. Um, I hate to put it that way, but, but sometimes that's what it is, because if you don't have a succession plan, that's where you're at. Um, <laughs> Sorry, for being 600, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, SBA does work with tech companies too, so I mentioned our small business development centers, and here in LA, we have Pixel Exchange, which as a small business development center that's partially funded by SBA, that's what they do, they work with tech companies, so they often help you scale up, help you get ready, get ready for that pitch, um, help you hone your product, um, and most often it's intellectual property based, so they understand the world of, I would have something tangible to get someone to invest in, which is often a challenge with tech companies. And then also through our Ventura County, it's called Economic Development Collaborative uh, Ventura County, EDCBC, just remember the letters. Um, they also do a lot of work with businesses who are trying to scale and are trying to prepare for venture, venture capital and they are equity investment and they work with them and get them ready and help them hone their pitches as well. So again, that scale from the $500 all the way through as you try to grow, um, SBA really is there and we do have tools and resources and partners um, that can help you. Well, the other thing is, is that we're, we're tracking 200 million over here. What about the STTR and SBIRs, uh, $10 billion that they have out there, and four to five billion of that's grant money where you never have to pay it back if you have high tech, scalable, um, commercial, um, fast tech, commercialized um, products and services? Right, so you'll hear SBIR, which is the program she mentioned, it's the Small Business Innovation and Research, and it is grant money. So grant money differs in the sense that it, you don't have to pay it back. And I think annually there, there's 10 agencies that put what their requirements are out and it's put on a website. And you can go out there and look at, okay, what agencies are looking for things like Department of Energy is usually on there. And they'll say, we're looking for this type of product or innovation. So if you happen to have a product or innovation that aligns with that, then you can apply for the grant money. So during that initial phase, that's what they help you do. So they give you grant money to get you up and running and then the STTR is when you can commercialize the product. So that comes after that initial SBIR. So that's out there as well, and that's part of SBA. And again, most people don't even know. So I'm gonna play show and tell. Mm -hmm. So I brought this handy dandy little worth its weight in gold magazine. It's called our resource guide. So for those of you who are in California, um, if you go to your SBA office in your state or region, you can download an electronic version that is tailored to your local um, area, or there's a national one as well if you just went to sba.gov. But it tells you all about these programs so you don't have to remember everything from today because it's overwhelming and I'm sure your heads will be saved by the time the day's over. Um, but what you can learn in here is incredible. And if you just take the time and invest in the education piece of it, you'll be surprised at how many free resources are out there to help you. And you know, we're talking about you know, maybe just starting out or scaling to a billion dollars, but the reality is everyone starts somewhere. And we often talk about like, okay, like who has SBA really helped? So sometimes we'll say like, you know, have you ever heard of like Under Armour? SBA started. Have you heard of Ben & Jerry's? Started with SBA. Um, so a lot of the big brands you see, you would never think that they started so small. 
I mean, even Apple, I mean, come on, they started really small and look at them now. So each of you have the potential to be that. So you've got to start somewhere, but education is the key. Knowing where to get funding, funding for what you need today, tomorrow, and then 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. FedEx started out of the garage. They got their $5 million loan from SBA, but you never see it again. So talk about, let's go to your level. We talked about Vanessa saying, or oh, you get acquired by me. Um, break it down a little bit uh, more English on what that is um, that you do and how you evaluate because we actually ask someone to be on the stage on the appraisal process. Meaning, what does that look like? How do we integrate it? Because you're not going to say, oh yeah, valuation is here, we're just going to give you the money. It's very much changed because if we were going to talk about we were going to invest in, say, cancer 20 years ago, people would throw money at a startup company because oh, you have the next drug, okay, we're going to do it. Now we have so many different platforms that we can evaluate a company and, and put that valuation in a completely different aspect. So from that access to capital side and whether you look into to buy a, a commodity, no matter what it is, or invest in some kind of development, what does that look like and how do you do that and how do you give that money in or buy? So to start off with that, um, I came to this country 25 years ago, so I'm, I'm an immigrant. I, uh, my mom came with us and my dad didn't. So, single family, I guess. Um, but uh, I started uh, three of my own ventures that post-exit. Uh, basically, I didn't go to SBA, but I went the credit card route, and I went to my friends, and I went to uh, friends that I made in a different you know, environment, and club buddies, and that's where we made some of those deals, and I got off the ground. Uh, the first was uh, technology play, was in the late 90s, in the cell phone boom of the industry. Uh, second was leather and goods, very small project, and the third was medical and dental supplies. And in every one of those occasions, I almost I was broke. I literally didn't have anything left because I put everything into the into the business. In one occasion, uh, the medical dental supply, uh, it was my finances were so dire that I uh, got a warehouse in uh, on a street called Elm in Orange County, right across the street from. And just stayed in, and uh, I was living with uh, where my mom was in, you know, in Beverly Hills. And by the time going back and forth, uh, it would cost a lot of gas. So I would choose to uh, have a blow-up mattress and sleep in the warehouse, so I didn't have to spend that much money in gas. That's how things, you know, get tough. But uh, to value the business, what we look at is, um, you know, parameters. So. Everything that you heard uh, is based on whether it's equity, meaning that you're buying a portion of a company, or you're going in debt, meaning that regardless of what your portion is, you have to pay them back first, the debt piece. And um, I think most people don't spend enough time to educate themselves, and the education process, even through the MBA, is not, doesn't get you ready for a real business. And uh, understanding the time that it takes for you to get ready to acquire either equity or debt, or a third piece which is called MET, like it's a combination of equity and debt, uh, is, is fairly complicated because you have to jump through you know, different ideas and present them and charts and so on and so forth. So it takes time to, to get that, you know, all the charts and data ready. And um, understanding that is where most people fail because they're either underfunded or uh, they're not ready to get the funding and they'll miss the boat. And it happens on a regular basis all the time. Um, so an area that I focus on is not special situation private equity. Um, I go into technology companies and so on and so forth because the, the tech entrepreneur, even though they put a perfect pitch together and they raise X amount of money, whether it's in hundreds of thousands or, or hundreds of millions of dollars, they, they can't execute because they don't have enough resources. They didn't plan well enough. So building that little bit of a cushion is, is always the key to get a project off the ground and be successful. Hence the, the, the little you know, story about me sleeping on a mattress. I wanted to have enough capital. Uh, but now going looking at the companies, um, we're looking for asset. And asset depends on what you're building. If you're on the technology side, you're building um, resources to uh, figure out who's your best 
client in uh, you know, mortgage and who are you going to take to? So regardless of what you're looking at, there are only a few people, which means uh, there's a process of sales. Uh, whether you're a lawyer, doctor, or in business, you're in sales. And if you're not selling, you're going out of business. And so looking at the sales process of every business is very crucial. So what I look at is the asset. The asset is the core underlying value that that business provides. And that could be anything from technology to real estate to um, you know, medical uh, technologies and, and know-how. Um, I've done things from simple software ways to nuclear medicine. Right? Um, and throughout the whole process, when I was on the investment banking side, we went through the same process too. We figured out what the value is, how do you grow the value. That's what, um, that's what the core value of private equity is. We find the value, and now that we understand what the asset is, we try to match it to the demand. What are people looking for? How do we monetize? So again, as I shared before, we take a couple pennies, obviously a little bit more, and, <laughs> and try to make it to a couple more pennies. That's, that's the whole process. Doesn't he make it sound like it's just so easy? <laughs> the point we've heard for the last three days was we get knocked off, we get back up. Here you are living in Beverly Hills at the same time you're sleeping on a blow up mattress in Anna. And I know exactly where that is. Um, my son graduated from Chapman University, so. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> and down the street many times. Um, but the idea is, is that knowing these resources, knowing how to minimize us falling off the path and keeping our focus is so important because that, that mental anguish or, or resources to continue to grow, if I only have that extra $500 or extra 50000 or 500 or whatever, or knowing some of the leverage. So what I'd like to go into is, is that what I talked about, and what's your biggest asset buy that you ever had? in the sense of funding or buying something that you've been involved in? Big <laughs> We're not gonna say like hundreds of billions, I don't know, five billion, two billion? I, I think the biggest asset we, we went after was Dodger Stadium, uh, uh, 2.1 billion. And you put that together? Uh, we had three Korean banks that backed up the deal, so the same deal process as SBA would require. Just minor. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is, is that, you know, Magic Johnson was involved in a lot of that and everything else. And, and who would think, you know, here's a basketball player who built up an incredible platform and he redid all of downtown LA and the whole aspect of putting his heart and soul, using his name, using his business sense to really engage the community back to grow. And, and no matter what you buy or scale, um, I know people that are out buying hospitality, they're buying 60% usage and within three months turn them into 95% usage. How is that possible? Why would you do that? It's because of scalability and profitability and then comes back to the access to your to show it. So if you can tell a story, whether you're buying a house, whether you're buying a, a business, or you're trying to get leverage to access to capital, it's all about the storytelling and that's where SBA comes back in. No matter your size, if you're thinking about going after the, you know, several hundred million, they're there to help you navigate the platforms, but it takes time and energy. It's not gonna happen overnight. They have to put together that platform. So I guess the question is, is that um, success rate, how many times do you have to pitch someone or go through a product, Vanessa, that you thought you, I believe was 1,500 per year startup companies for women? How many that would you say that you've seen, that you vet before you fund, and then from the or invest in personally, and what's your success rate based on the last couple of years of conversion into see, uh, see them uh, execute grow? Yeah, so for us, um, well, they're really early stage, and we've only been in operations for five years, so we, general investment timeline of a venture fund, for instance, is like a 10-year Term, so we've only really seen these companies grow from one to five so far. Um, some interesting stats on the success of female founding companies. Uh, generally speaking, in our database, over 57%, I 
think of female-founded companies when they come to us and apply for programming or to be a part of the network, or they're, they're revenue generating already. So if you compare that to, I mean, Techstars, Y Combinator, any of these other early seed stage technology incubation or acceleration platforms, female founders are really, have some great traction by the time they're ready to raise capital. So that's been an interesting statistic. Um, I think of the, uh, I guess, percentage-wise, we're seeing there's only about 30% of founders in our pipeline that convert from pre-seed to raising a seed round of capital. So it's pretty, it's low. I guess that's not comparatively to the to the market. That's probably higher. But um, yeah, so about 30% of 1,500 companies per year are successful at closing some round of funding, whether it be $150,000 convertible note or their $2 million seed. Um, success, again, like from an exit standpoint, we've seen there's been about 23 companies that have come through our programming thus far in the last five years that have gone from raising early stage capital to exiting or selling their company to one of our corporate acquirers or a private equity firm or, uh, or otherwise. So, the, it, it, the entrepreneurship is not easy, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, it's also a longer timeline than you think. I think the biggest thing that entrepreneurs think is that you see the success stories and you think that it happened overnight and it really didn't. I mean, it's three companies, it's living in a garage, it's doing all these things that, yeah, it's a, it's a long timeline and maybe you fail on your first three and the fourth one is a hit. So I think it's a long, yeah. Success is a long-term career for sure. It didn't come overnight, you know, and, and that's the whole idea is, is that we're trying to hit long-term relationships, how to leverage the resources and continue to stay within your network. Um, Tammy always talks about having your tribe. I believe your tribe and the businesses is that, you know, if you have a product that you know is just fantastic, you turn around now that you know Sean, say, hey, Sean, I got this product that I, I need your help in, and who do you know that's going to be in my system? Um, it's like Wendy running around, you know, um, who referred you to me to be on this panel just yesterday afternoon at 11 o'clock at night said yes, and so he's here on the stage. But the platform is, is that this is how, talking about Wendy walking in, but this is what, this is nothing to call you out, Wendy, um, but the idea is, is that this is how the game's played. This is knowing the rules of the game to play the game, is how to leverage, because if you have that missing link, we now, you know, you hear a lot about the opportunity zones, how to develop and how to grow. Yeah, you have a qualified funds to raise the capital to infiltrate and, and actually build this, this incredible community and invest into it. But the idea is, is that you have to have all the pieces of the puzzle. And that's what I'm trying to get together is saying, here's your integration level, okay, from micro to billions. Um, and then let's talk about the factor of the global side. How do we deal with the, the client that, that I work with is that from, they're another country, very small country, um, and they have so much funds that they actually outbid each other because there's no more, there's no more uh, products and services that they can build and grow within their own community, country, community, cool. and so they came in and started investing in the United States. And they have this incredible platform. I mean, it's going to be the SBA rates. I'm not to put you down, sorry. Um, you know, could you imagine getting a billion and a half dollars at a four to four to seven percent interest rate? You know, we heard that yesterday with a five percent Kickstarter rate. You know, that's incredible capital. But they have very defined lines what they're looking for, and a couple different other platforms that you're going with. But this is what they're dealing with. They said it's not just the local market of what they're doing in the United States. You're looking for your your product that's in another country. Um, coming money coming in and money going out and also investment. Um, and so when we looked at the opportunity zones earlier uh, yesterday, we looked at the uh, impact of what it's bringing in that a lot of the people started that build, you know, like um, the several of the family office space are building these huge projects in other countries. They said, wait a second, I get a great tax write off to come in and bring it back and invest these properties and acquisitions here in the United States versus in other countries. So how do we navigate, um, and, uh, uh, I guess it's the best way, from an access to capital is, the more we know about our climate, the more we know about, not talking about just weather climate, but the climate of our, our customer and our consumer base of what's gonna buy and what's gonna be scalable. Uh, we heard Brett from Chapman University talk about knowing our target, knowing our market really well from the demographics, from a, 
from having the, the analytics to go with it. Um, what kind of resources do you use to look at that from your level off between Sean and Vanessa I'd like to look at? I, we only operate in North America right now, so Canada okay. and the US. I've had, we have a lot of interest from, uh, I guess, China, Chinese investors who want access to innovation within the United States, so they will come to us looking for deal flow. That's kind of the one way. Um, and then I guess our other way that we bridge gaps for entrepreneurs globally is through our corporate innovation partnerships. So a lot of corporate, all corporations are slow, slogging, really bad at early stage innovation, um, or traditionally have been. Hopefully there's no big car bikes on the letter. <laughs> and no, we talk um, loud, no modeling, we, it's okay. No, so, so yeah, so we work with a lot of um, the, the larger, you know, multi-billion dollar companies in the world to source early stage. There's like a fun stuff. Yeah, there's a fun stuff. <laughs> it's distracting me. Uh, so <laughs> we, source, we source early stage deal flow for these large corporates and they often have arms all over the globe. So they're looking for different things. For example, uh, we work with Procter & Gamble Ventures or their innovation side and they have a very thesis driven approach to what they want to invest in, partner companies they want to partner with and companies they want to acquire. They also have obviously massive resources in terms of consumer data, in terms of supply chain, merchandising, anything that you need to get your company to scale rapidly and to scale globally. So our bridge, hypothetically, it could be construed as global, but so we work with them to, to target early stage companies that have really high potential given their thesis statements, um, and then they will partner with our companies on specific issues or problems that our businesses are going through and help them scale. And it's kind of a deep diligence program on Procter & Gamble's part or AARP's part. They wanna understand and meet these entrepreneurs, they wanna see the technology that's happening, and then they wanna help these companies scale and grow and be investment and equity partners in them. So that is one of the ways that my organization helps with entrepreneurs accessing global markets and there is some interest from Asian investors uh, to come into the US too, which we source for as well. So Sean, what kind of, if we were to die, um, draw a diagram of what you look for as far as your crystal ball that you'd love to um, acquire and or go after and be part of, what would that look like? Um, probably two categories. One, an older uh, family member or you know, entrepreneur that started a project that are getting ready just to exit based on their age and they're tired of dealing with day-to-day -day businesses. Um, second category would be probably some kind of a corporate car ride because a lot of big corporate, as you mentioned, they, uh, even when they go after buying a business, they pretty much suck life out of that business and run it as if it's just running on automated. There's no R&D done, there's no management on top of it, on and on. They, there's just you know, as few as possible to run the corporate. And sometimes you know, these big corporates, you know, they bypass that product because that's in their downline. They're not really looking for it anymore. And the market turned around and now it's a, it's a big thing. So there, there was a case a couple years ago where there was a big uh, entity had a subsidiary with uh, RVs uh, outlets, and uh, they were trying to literally get rid of the the you know the factory and the workers and all the assets. We walked in for less than cost of building the factory, and turned around and just brought in you know a little bit more computerized product to the uh, you know equipment, and it was able to, to be turned around and have really high valuation and so or um, as you mentioned on the Asian investors we, we went into an asset which was self-storage uh, roll-up that there was a little case special situation that we went into and we got in at uh, 8.25 uh, caps and within 18 months we had an offer uh, that equated to about 4.7 and I literally looking at the numbers I couldn't figure out Who's making money on this? Because it doesn't matter what bank you go to, uh, 
you still, your cost of capital is so high, what are you making out of it? And after we sold it, we figured out that there were Korean buyers. So post FX transaction, they're into the sixes, that's how they, they, made, they made their money. So and the US side, even though we saw it was so slim. Understand the resource uh, on one side and structuring equity or debt. Uh, a lot of the fear from the forum comes uh, with the debt piece and the convertible debt and specifically. And that has to do with valuation and understanding. If you're going to sell something at much more expensive, hoping that you're going to make it and you fail, you're going to lose out of the opportunity. One last question. You're kidding. Go for it. Angie. Stand up. Hi. How would you put a value on a service based industry? I'm curious. Depends what it is, where you're at, <laughs> who's on your team, who. It, there's so many different factors that go into valuing a business, and it, it just really depends on how about, how about How about, let's scale it down a little bit. I, I, I know where Angie, I think, is going from this. So, any kind of basic checkbook guide that you know of that if you start out in school or on the entrepreneur end that you can resource them to say here's a book I read or here's a here's a platform that kind of gives you the basic overview or should we just say go to SBA and have them go over the basics with them. Just get in their mind. It's not that it's a valuation thought process. I feel like SBA values things lower than uh, <laughs> the market. Uh, well I would agree. I mean they're conservative. They're a guarantee program. I hate to say this but you will die and uh, you will pay your taxes and you will pay your SBA loan. There is no forgiveness. That's true. Just like student loan does the same thing. Well student don't know it's a little different. They're trying to abolish it. They're trying. Um, but in terms of valuation services if you were going to get an SBA loan for our valuation, before you get the loan, SBA sort of dictates what type of valuation service we would accept. So as part of the loan preparation, if you were buying a business that had professional services or something like that, there is um, in our SOPs and our, our regulations um, some guidance that talks about what's acceptable as valuation services. So if on a smaller scale, that might give you some guidance. You can go and look or you can reach out to us and we can tell you like what our regulations say is acceptable valuation services. Add 20%, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Closing yeah. thought real quick. Should I ask? Sure, please, please. So um, on private equity is a little bit different because we're looking, uh, venture capital is focused on a spray and pray. They raise a certain amount of capital <laughs> and they spray it as fast as they can hoping that they're going to get a result. We have exactly the opposite view, which means that I'm looking for asset and I want to know exactly what the asset is and hopefully I get SDA value so I'll make a delta higher than what I'm looking for. Um, Jeez. And, and that deltas could be fluctuating. <laughs> but uh, on a regular uh, investment banking or accounting based um, valuation, it's typically uh, either based on 3x of the gross value, what are you selling? or uh, four to six times, and in some sectors you get up to seven times uh, what your um, you know, um, revenue before uh, taxes are. Yes. <laughs> so closing thoughts, so closing thoughts for uh, Terry. Uh, one takeaway to sum it, say what do we gotta get done? So my takeaway for each of you is to go back, reevaluate where you are, where you want to go, and then see how you scale yourself to, to get to wherever that end result is for you. And then remember, SBA is here to help from today through eternity. eternity. Mm. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Vanessa? Um, I'm not sure this whole demo here, whether it's entrepreneurs, investors, uh, it's all, all different levels, so okay. uh, they're all executives, but from all different industries. Okay. So I mean, yeah, there's a ton of resources for first-time business owners out there. More and more increasingly, people targeting female entrepreneurs. So it's a really, really good time to be a woman entrepreneur. Uh, and yeah, there, there's there's 
so much out there. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you're raising capital or if you want more knowledge on that. Uh, from, on the flip side too, which we didn't really chat about today and from an investment perspective though, I think that women really need to step up to the table and start looking at alternative assets and investment strategies too. I don't know how many of you invest, whether it's in you know your own stock account or whether you invest in real estate or whatever else, but there's a lot of interesting deals in angel investing and venture. If you have the money to get into PE or hedge funds, the world, you can make a ton of money there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, I think that my like end notes being that as women, we really need to start to think about owning our financing, making money on our money, and investing in other women entrepreneurs is a great way to do that. So <laughs> I did that. Thank you very much. We have some startup companies that are in here in the audience, and we'll connect you. And then also, um, uh, Sean, close it out with your final thought. So understanding where the value is and how do you take that value and uh, literally, it's, a, it's kind of fictitious and a joke, but it's true. How do you take a couple pennies and make a couple more pennies? That's the whole thesis of this business. And people sell themselves to shorts thinking they're not smart enough, they're not tall enough, they're, they're, they're not in the right environment. It's not true. Everyone at every level, uh, it doesn't matter how much money you have and what your height and gender and on and on is. You have an ability to make an impact. Um, and if you just figure out what the resource is and match it to demand, you'll have fun. Let's thank our thank incredible you. panel. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'm going to one more time shamelessly promote something from SBA. <laughs> Um, we often partner with faith-based communities as well as part of our mission to connect communities. And next week we have an event in High Pin. Um, she has been a good partner to SBA in the faith-based community for some of our events that we've done. So next week we have our faith-based summit, which is no cost. It's going to be held in Carson, California. And it's a very difficult topic to talk about. Um, so this year's theme is safe, secure, and sustainable communities. And we're gonna talk about um, preparedness in terms of safety, physical safety, cyber safety, and a lot of it will be um, presented by like FBI. We have the IRS criminal investigator to talk about the cyber side of things. And after the incidents of this weekend, I think it's a really important narrative that we have to have from a small business perspective, like how do we prepare our businesses to be safe for people who are coming and they're our clients, how do we help prepare our communities for something that may happen, and how do we link in our churches, in synagogues, mosques, temples, which is where a lot of people gravitate to in times of need. Um, so it's a really important discussion to start. We're hoping to plant seeds and get community leaders, um, academic leaders, and also small businesses to come out and take part in the discussion. So I have a flyer, you can register on Eventbrite. And again, it's gonna be, it used to be Stop Hub on the campus of Cal State Dominguez Hills, but now they call it the Ascension Health Stadium, and it's going to be like in the, the event part of it. So I invite you all out. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.